Hello, everyone, and welcome to another message from Fountain Springs Church. My name is Todd, and I'm a pastor at FSC. I'm so glad that you're joining us, but no, you're not just joining me, but our in-person and online platforms as we all worship God together. Today, we're gonna to hear another message from one of our pastors, which, spoiler alert, it could be me. And it's been shortened a bit to be broadcasted here on your screen. If you wanna to listen to the whole message, go to our website at fs.church messages. Again, we are so glad you're joining us. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, if you're brand new, especially brand new to church, really, I hope you feel welcome. Um, maybe you're trying to decipher, is this a cult or not? <laughs> we are not a cult, but that's what cults also say. <laughs> so I'm aware of a bit of a problem we have. Hey, if you're brand new, here's what we're about to do. We're, we're starting a new series of sermons. What that means is the Bible can actually get complicated if you only isolate one little verse and try to make that verse what you want it to be. And the Bible says a lot of things all over the place inside the Bible about a lot of things. So a series takes a subject and we begin to look at the whole of the Bible and see what does the whole of the Bible say about that. And we just spend some time there. So we're going to spend some time there. So eventually I'm going to take you, eventually I'm going to take you to the book of Genesis. It's the first book in the, in the Bible. But before we do, I want to show you something that I ran across on the internet. It was a question on, on Reddit. And this will help us get to where we're going. The question uh, starts off with this subject. Is it bad if I don't understand why family is a value? It's a great question. So this person says, is it bad if I don't understand why family is a value? I felt like I've taken that on as a value for so long, but I'm coming to terms with the fact that I genuinely don't feel like family is a value for me internally. I don't understand it. My family always say that family is a value, but they don't explain to me why, or they don't have solid reasoning or emotion behind it. Has anyone else felt this way? I think this is not the only person asking this question. In fact, if you look at what's going on in our world, even more specifically what's going on in our nation, one of the deficiencies is this, not to give you all my opinions right at the beginning, is that I think we're confused about family because we have a lot of different experiences with family. Even the fact, me bringing up the terminology family, you might be like, oh, because your family experience might actually be bad to where it stirs up bad memories. Maybe your, uh, your mom or your dad or both weren't who you hoped they would be. Maybe right now you're not even speaking to some of your family or they're not speaking to you, however that's working for you. And it's a bit like just tense. Family can be this blissful, wonderful thing. Some of you are like, oh, I love family. And some of you are like, I can't stay in family. I'm just so annoyed by family. So here's what we're going to talk about. is how do we actually have the good conversation on family? I, I looked up statistics on family nowadays, and there's some weird things going on, by the way. Uh, or interesting things, I should say. Uh, people are getting married later than they used to. My grandma got married when she was 16. I've specifically told our 16-year-old, not happening. <laughs> not happening, right? So you got that, but generation stuff was going on back then. You know, you basically, people, a lot of times, uh, get married, go to war, right? And there was, it was, oh, but nowadays people are getting married. They're, they're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, which is fine. I'm just telling you a statistic. And then, uh, if you want to know conversations I'm having, uh, some folks who are couples are concerned about actually, like, getting married, like, going through the ceremony, like, calling themselves husband and wife and all that kind of stuff because of the precedent that was set for them. In other words, they're concerned that they're going to break up, get divorced like their parents or their grandparents did, or, or, and, they, and they don't want to do that, so they're concerned that, that by getting married, that's going to change something, so they just pretend to be married. They do all the married things, but don't actually have a covenant with each other. In other words, they're test driving each other, and that doesn't, it's not a great model to set. There's a new term called, uh, and you're going you're gonna to think I'm making this up. There's a new term called dinks. Dual income, no kids, right? 
almost to where it's become a trend on, on, I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying now there is a group of people championing it. It's like, why in the world would you have kids? It's just interesting. All I'm doing is bring up like, what's going on? I'm not casting judgment. Just saying it's interesting because that was not always the case. So we have a world right now who is constantly saying, here's what family is and isn't. In fact, it's weird that I'm talking to you about family and some of you think I'm getting political. It's crazy. I'll get that email. It'll be fine. So I want you to know, (laughs) I've only been talking about family. We'll walk away going, that was a politically laced sermon. I'm talking about family. But because we've, we've bought the lie that family is about politics. No, family is an amazing thing. Here's why we're talking about it. Let me tell you why we're talking about it. Because our word of the year is disciple. Our word of the year is disciple. We're trying to be followers of Jesus, not just simply fans of his. So we don't want to just like play the game, be uh, religious. We don't want to just be the group of people that live up north in South Dakota where there's the Black Hills and stuff like that and say, yeah, family is super important because maybe you had a good experience or because we have Storybook Island. I don't know why you think it is, but, but when you think about this place, there's a bit of a family values thing. And if you live in our neck of the woods, as they say, oftentimes we get described as they still care about family. What you and I should do, though, if we're followers of Jesus, no matter what culture you find yourself in, if you're a follower of Jesus, you should begin going. But what does, what's God say? What's God say about family? I know I got my opinions, my experiences, my thoughts. You might have your trajectory and you're like, oh, here's what we're doing and here's what I'm striving to do. But if you're single right now and you think your only next step is to get married and that's all the option, I want you to begin thinking, why do you think that's your only option? If you're married and you think that the only way God can be good is if you have two and a half kids and a picket fence, where two and a half is weird anyways, but, two, like, if you be, but do we not do this? We do this with like moments where we think that we have, okay, I've got this moment. Checked off, good. Now grandma's going to ask about the kids. Check, all right, now. Now the goal is get them out of the house. And it becomes this weird, have you ever thought about like, yeah, but what does God want? What does God say is good? We talk about regularly, if you're single, it's a great opportunity. Don't treat it like an obstacle. I know some of you are, you're, you're praying that you would have kids. And it's not happening. And it's devastating to you. I understand how painful that is. Literally, Katie and I understand how painful that is. But sometimes we get so trapped in what we're wrestling with, we forget. But what does God say? What's the purpose of this? What, why? All that stuff. And so this is what the series is going to do. In fact, well, fun. There's one week I'm like, I can't preach that because everyone will yell at me. So Katie's going to preach it. So you'll smile at her. <laughs> so that'll be fun. Uh, Let's start what I think is the most logical place to start because my role in your life is not really to give you my opinion. My role in your life is to share with you what God has said about and then just go down the list, right? So whose idea was family? I can tell you all about that. So let me tell you about whose idea, because guess what? Uh, It's not yours. Uh, Whose idea was family? Let me show you what the Word of God says about whose idea. Genesis chapter 2, we'll start at the very beginning. Then the Lord God said... It is not good for the man to be alone. Always leave room there for someone to affirm that. Nope, it's too late now because I just had to say that. (laughs) It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper. I'll make a helper who is, listen, just right for him. Now, last year, I uh, did a whole sermon series, Controlled Burn, all about God and sexuality. We're not going that direction with this series. But what I just said, who is just right for him. Pay attention to those words. It doesn't even translate well into English. The wording is so specific. God's like, I made this guy. He needs help. I'm going to make the most perfect helper. I'm going to make the most perfect partner. I'm going to, and so he does. Don't miss out on the language. He doesn't go like, it doesn't matter who his friend is. It doesn't matter who he's with. It, no, he didn't say that. I will make a helper who is just right for him. And then uh, keep reading a few verses later. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. 
While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man at last. The man exclaimed, I bet he said that. Uh, (laughs) This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from a man. Not creative, but it works. This explains why a man leaves, now this is interesting, leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. That is family language. It's fascinating. What is that? I got no attention span. Is this this? Oh, hold on. I don't know what I just did, but I have no attention span. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. (laughs) You have no idea where my brain is now. It's all over the place. (laughs) The Bible just brought up family roles. Not, you didn't invent them. God just brought them up. Adam and Eve sin, and God has to deal with the sin because God is so good to deal with sin. He doesn't avoid sin because it's so bad. So Genesis chapter 3, in him dealing with it, he, then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. If you wanted to know, like, why is it like this? Uh, sin, you can blame it on sin. Uh, Adam and Eve just kind of make them feel bad. Uh, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man, he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed. Because of you, all your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Again, this is not a sermon series about this moment in particular, other than are you noticing from the very beginning of the Bible what our current culture is wrestling with on what is family, what is the makeup of a family, who should, what are roles, all the gender stuff and all that. The Bible's like, yeah, I solved it, solved it near the beginning. Um, and, and notice the roles that are listed out here. This is interesting. If you want to know who invented Family, I think you're getting the idea of who invented it, who created it. it go to the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, uh, most of us have at least heard of the Ten Commandments, and we think of these, this list of ten specific rules, but a lot of us, don't, if you don't, haven't read the Ten Commandments in the Bible. And you know there's more than just those Ten Commandments written there. Let me, let me read to you this portion. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. And here's the the rule. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. So far, you're like, yeah, I've kind of heard this stuff before. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affections for any other gods. So here's the first couple commandments, and they're pretty extreme, but watch this. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. You're like, I didn't see that etched on the marble Ten Commandments. No, this is in the Bible. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. This is language from God. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me, but I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. I want you noting something that all throughout the Bible, and these are just a few areas of the Bible, all throughout the entire Bible, God has spoken about who it's, whose idea of family was, and family is God's idea. From the very beginning, It's God who came up with it. It's God who built the construct of it. It's God who says, here's the best markers for it. It's God said, here's how you should start a family, run a family, lead a family, fix a family, restore a family. Here's how a family should thrive. It's God. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this is where you start. You don't start with, but I feel like, well, frankly, who cares? Because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you got to say, but what was originally designed, what did God say was absolute best? And even though all of us come, all of of us, all of us come from broken families. All of us come from jacked up. All of us have family members. All of us have 
our own personal examples of where we have not been the representation of Jesus Christ to our family or has not been represented to us. So we all understand brokenness in the midst of our family. All the brokenness and the pain and the trauma that many of us have experienced with family does not change the fact God came up with it and God said how to do it. So you and I start there. We start there. All right, all right, David. So he invented it. Next question, why? (laughs) Because some of us are like, because it's painful or it's difficult. Some of us are like, I love it, it's great, you're in a great season, but but why? That's what we've got to talk about because if we've got a world going, well, here's what it is, here's what it is, here's what it is, you and I start with, okay, who made it, but why? Why why did God say, why did God say uh, that this is how I wanted to put together and not come up with some other idea? Why didn't he just say, hey, I made you, up to you to do whatever you want to do? Why did he lay this out? I can give you a few reasons. We're not going to nail them all. I'll give you three today because that's about as much as we can take. I'll start off with the easy one. You you, you kind of looking at me like you need, okay, we'll do the easy one. Here's the easy one. Why? Because you and I need intentional support in our lives. Now, when you think about family, by the way, you can take this a little bit further if you want. Maybe you don't like your family. Maybe you're mad at your family. Maybe you're not talking to your family. You're like, I don't want this sermon. Guess what? The Bible describes Christians as being a part of the family of God. So if you want, if you're refusing to think about, about your biological family or, or if, if, you, if, or if you're just the family you grew up with, if, if you would apply it to your church family, I think you're still, you're still in a good place. And according to what I read in the Bible, God made the family because God knew that you and I would need each other to do life well. Intentional support. Let me show you Ecclesiastes, just one of the areas. Two people are better off than one. I know we read this usually at weddings, but you need to know it's not just for weddings. Two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better. For a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Just one of the examples in Scripture that gives us evidence that you and I, if we're part of a family and how we function as a family, we're supposed to be supporting each other. I said this is the easy one because most of us are like, oh, I got it. I do everything for my children. I know. Stop it. <laughs> right? This is the easy one because I think, I think we've taken this one too far. We've moved from like intentional support to doing everything for people. And we gotta, we got to be careful about this, that we, we live in this world where we're often just like rescuing here, rescuing there, and, and we're like, yeah, I'm doing everything. There's lawn mowing parents, helicopter parents. There's all these names for these parents. It's right. So intentional, intentional support. Here, here that's, intentional support is as important as emergency support. Emergency support is, is necessary. We all have, right, people in our lives who are constantly in an emergency and they can constantly take your time. But did you know that it is more wise to be intentional even outside of emergencies? Sometimes our most loved ones around us only get us if there's an emergency around. I think it's one of these where, where that scripture I read to you talked about like, like fighting back to back, but also just picking each other up supporting each other, that requires some intentionality and conversation. So maybe this is the word of God just kind of maybe prompting some of us. Have you just been in emergency mode where your kids or your spouse or your parents or your aunts or your uncles or your church family only get you if it's an emergency? And if so, pay attention to that because intentionality is a whole lot better. Let me tell you a second one. These will get more difficult. It'll be fun. Don't worry about it. I believe, according to the Bible, that God made family not just to support each other, but to reflect God's love. That God intentionally assembled a group of people so that 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 group of people would not just be like, oh, they're a nice family. That they would reflect, that they would display the love of God. This had me thinking. Last year, uh, Katie was wanting to do like a, a, a 
Christmas card or social media post like, hey, everybody, this is our family. And I was like, cool. I got the perfect photographer. Me. Because I'm the cheapest I know. So this is going to work. I'm, I regret this decision. For those of you who are photographers, you're like, it's you people. I know. I regret this. I won't do this again. So we went outside. We found some trees and some grass. And Katie's mad at me for showing this picture to you. I was like, I got, a, I got an iPhone. I have a tripod. And I have a watch that I can control my phone with. Who needs a photographer? Obviously, I do. I believe I'm the one not looking at the picture. Uh, and some of you are like, you're judging me on the shadows. I understand, okay? I regret my decision. I don't regret my favorite and best picture I took, though. I'd like to show it to you. Uh, this is pretty much, this is what should be hung up in our house. Show them that next one, would you? I think, if they have it. There's one more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can kind of, just Katie. There's Ellie. I mean, what more do you need? Put that right when you come into the house. So here, here. so uh, Katie and I have been married for 21 years, four kids, but we've also taken our own family pictures when we were young kids. Here's what I know about family pictures. What you see is not what really happened, especially if you have children around. If they're five or younger, uh, by the time you're done, you hate each other just for a little bit. And, and, and oftentimes now, even nowadays, we take the... Uh, the the, the reality photo, but we take like 20 pictures of the reality photo, so it's not even a reality anymore because like social media, you're like, what's going on? The reason I was thinking about like, if God made families to reflect the love of God, what if family pictures were a little different? What would a family photo look like if it were a reflection of behavior and values? What if, what if you're like, you, you, know, you, you book the, the session and you, and you go as a family to a professional photographer, which is, that's a part of the lesson in this sermon, is get a professional photographer. And, and you show up and, and, and you get the picture taken. But, but then when they, when they call you or send you the link and say, hey, here's the proofs, here's what it turned out. Rather than like faces, you're seeing values and behaviors. Some of us are like, I don't want that picture. But did you know that that's, I believe, why God made families was to reflect the love of God. So how you talk to each other, how you spend your time, how you spend your money, how you forgive each other, how you engage the responsibilities of life should be reflecting the love of God at school, at work, even in the privacy of your home. Let me show you Ephesians 5, talking about marriage. And further, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I'm going to read you more. Some of you, stop reading the rest of this, okay? Just... Don't read this. But this sentence here, don't forget it. Otherwise, you're going to be grossly offended. Some of you, just you're not paying attention. You're, you're going to be offended. Anyways, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Don't forget that. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of, the house, of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body and the church. And the church submits as the church submits to Christ. So you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Some of you are mad right now. I can feel it. You forgot to read the first sentence. For husbands, you're like, man, the guys just, they don't do anything. For husbands, this means love your wives. You're like, yeah, that's easy. Just as Christ loved the church. You're like, what's that mean? He gave up his life for her. To make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. This is why, by the way, if men don't lead like they're supposed to lead, culture erodes. This is one powerful verse, but see, we look at look at all the language through here. How a marriage is supposed to work, are you catching it? it they're supposed to reflect the love of God to each other. That's, that's what we miss. We get so offended by the words like of submit and all that kind of stuff. 
But what's, what we're learning here is if you reflect the love of God to your spouse and even to your kids and other people around, if you reflect the love of God, you are building a family that is stronger than any evil out there. There's key words here. Love, submission, sacrifice, holy. If, there's, there's more if you read study scripture about how do you reflect the love of God. You begin to look at what scripture says about the love of God and start working on that as a family and reflect that on how you engage all of life. I told you they get a little harder. Let's see where this one goes. Here's the third one, last one. I believe God made the family in order to prioritize spiritual formation. If the word spiritual formation is new to you, it's where you're growing your relationship with God. You're letting God transform you, shape you, mold you. And we use words like spiritual formation, like not just like, like how tall did you actually get, but like how are you forming in your relationship with the Lord. The family was created not just to uh, accomplish certain things in life and get your kid to get some participant trophy and all of a sudden then you, and for you to go on some dream vacation and for you to own something that you've always wanted to own it's so that those in your family unit would spiritually form and grow we could prove it deuteronomy moses is giving basically one of his final speeches he's telling all the people that have been freed from slavery like some last words in essence listen O israel the lord is our god the lord alone and you must, so this is like, so do this. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Well, great words, right? Hey, everybody, love God with everything you've absolutely got. If you got it, love him with it. Love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Like, do this wholeheartedly. But watch this. It feels like a major application. So, repeat them again and again to your children. Fascinating. That he's like, last words in essence, last sermon. He's like, love God with everything you've got. And they're like, all right. He's like, all right, here's how you do this. Make sure your kids know. All right. Well, we'll send them to church. Right? Like, see, I think, I think you might be missing what he's saying here. Because... Uh, and, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly. So they're, 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 thinking, they're thinking, like, how am I fully committed? Like, repeat them again and again to your children. I bet, I'm not making a poll, nobody raise your hands. I bet you think that's entirely about the child. I don't think it is. Repeat them. Re In other words, hey, parents, um, you're going to need to teach this to your kids so you learn it too. I'm convinced that God set the family up not just so that kids would get sent to church and hear what they need to hear. It was so that the parents would teach the kids so the parents would also know what they needed in their soul. Have you ever believed something and not behaved it out? Do you need me to make you raise your hands? I will, right? right all right. And you know one of the ways to combat that is to teach it because the more you teach it, you feel accountable to it. Moses was a smart dude. He kept going. Uh, so here, that repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road. When you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders if you want. I mean, it's up to you. Uh, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Moses says, love God with everything you've got. It's the last thing I want to say to you is love God with everything you've got. And make sure, you make sure your family knows. Interesting language. Here's what he's saying. Make sure your family knows eternity is a bigger deal than the temporary. That's what he's trying to get across to them. And if you're not aware of this, this is a vacuum. We're so glad you tuned in today. Fountain Springs Church is located in the Black Hills of South Dakota, but our community reaches beyond our neighborhoods and spreads around the whole world. Our website is a great way to give, get involved, and get connected. 
If you appreciate our ministry and want to be part of our mission to show people who Jesus is, here's what I'd recommend. Join us financially. When you do that, you're giving other people the opportunity to hear what you just heard. So here's a way to do that. Visit our website at fs.church slash give. And thank you so much for being with us today. And let's do our best this week to show people who Jesus is.